computer. Cool. Well, everyone who's joining us in the chat today, I already see Lucas, Andrea, and Todd have written in. Well, hello, hello. For everyone who's joining us today, feel free to say hello in the comments. You know, let us know where you're writing in from. We're always curious where folks join us from for these workshops. Today we have Corey Haynes, who will be just starting in a few moments once we walk through some, you know, a little bit technical housekeeping. Um, we're really excited for this workshop. I mean, if you've joined us for Corey's workshops before, I learn things in these. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> having worked in product for a long time to, to have someone of Corey's nature and expertise, like these workshops are incredible. So Corey, we're, you know, even before we start, I appreciate that you're here personally. Thank you. And I'm always glad to hear that someone learned something from me. So especially from a guy <laughs> like you, as long as there's one kind of golden nugget you can take away, I'm happy. For sure. For sure. So uh, we're going to get started probably in two to three minutes. Oh, we have someone here from Italy. That's awesome. Um, you know, feel free to use the chat box in the comments. We're going to be grabbing questions out of uh, the, the chat throughout the workshop and especially at the end for, for Corey to answer. How today's going to work is, you know, in two to three minutes, Corey's going to introduce himself, walk through his workshop. It's going to take about, you know, 30 to 45 minutes. We're going to leave 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. If there's any topics you'd like Corey to cover, perhaps you didn't uh, touch upon in the workshop, this is a great opportunity to put those questions in the chat and, you know, have put these in front of Corey to, to get his answer, or, you know, to get his guidance on air. Um, before we kick this off, just a bit of technical housekeeping, because YouTube is YouTube. And let me just share my screen for a second. For everyone who is tuning in and perhaps your video is a bit fuzzy because that's something we see folks write in for, you know, feel free to click on the settings icon in your YouTube and just make sure your quality is set to 720p. I mean, mine auto defaulted to that, but if you're at 360 or 240, uh, you know, 720 is going to give you the best result. Let me stop sharing my screen. Click over to here. Uh, I'll post this in the chat as well. For anyone who joins late, there will be a replay available. Um, like I said, I think it's time to kick this thing off. Today we have with us Corey Haynes, formerly of Bear Metrics, one of our just an incredible creator we have on Teachable. Today he's going to be going through uh, 10 different mental models for marketing. Um, like I said, we're really excited for this. As you have questions, please post them in the chat. And without further ado, Corey, please tell us a bit about yourself and your workshop today. All right, fantastic. Um, welcome and thanks for having me again uh, and for listening to me once more. Today I'm going to be covering uh, the 10 mental models that will change the way you do marketing. So like I said, I'm Corey, worked at Bear Metrics for almost two years. Before that was the first marketing hire at a company called Cordial. And I'll actually talk a little bit about uh, both of those experiences and sort of how they color what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but yeah, I'm from San Diego and stoked to jump in. So why don't we get started here without further ado, the 10 mental models that will change the way you do marketing. So it's basically all a sneak peek from the course, mental models for marketing. Um, I'm covering 10 today and sort of like a brief, fact, um, a, a brief fashion, but there's I think 40, maybe even 42, I wanna say that I cover within the course. And they're all basically taking a mental model, a framework, a principle, and then how to apply that for your marketing, which has been a game changer for me. Um, the reason why I built it and the reason why mental models are important and why I sort of started this whole thing was when I was the first marketing hire at Cordial, uh, it was my first kind of gateway into marketing. Uh, I started as an intern and I worked my way, way, way up to being sort of the, the marketing manager and uh, trying to do all the things. I had big, big expectations. We had just raised a, a series A. Um, zero experience and basically had to figure out a way to learn how to do my job as a marketer. Um, so, you know, I was reading blog posts all day, podcasts, books, audio books, Udemy courses, sometimes, you know, just be like four to five hours a day of just trying to learn and not make a fool of myself, right? So that I can actually have a uh, intelligent input in meetings, right? Or I could be able to follow through with the things that I said that I wanted to do, um, be able to do what other people asked me to do, right? So I learned tons and tons and tons of tactics. I just felt like I sort of immersed myself into the world of marketing, but I still found myself really frustrated because I didn't know how to apply a tactic or a strategy to our company, to our business, right? And what I should do. Um, you know, you can't really copy and paste marketing. You can sort of like imitate a little bit, but nothing's going to be exactly the same. No two companies are going to serve the exact same uh, customer persona. You know, you have different industries, different products, right? Um, and I always got the feeling like I was behind, 
Like I didn't know what I was doing. I was sort of making it up along the way, right? And I really don't like that feeling. Um, I don't know about you, but I really want to be strategic and I want to be able to have vision and, and have confidence in what I'm doing, right? So I don't constantly feel like an imposter in my job. And the problem with a lot of the hacks and tricks and tactics that you read about is that they're for other people, right? And so you only see the end result. You don't see uh, all the things that went on behind the scenes of how did someone come to make this decision or how did they come up with this really unique kind of innovative strategy, right? You only hear about the end result, about that crazy growth hack, right? That paved the way to the IPO or a trick that helped people, you know, meet their lead quota or a new tactic that, you know, quadrupled your, your conversion rate. But no one talks about how they got there, right? And what I wanted to do was get away from a lot of, a lot of the imitation marketing, right? I want to be able to think for myself. Um, and again, it's always reinventing the wheel, creating a new landing page, writing a blog post, um, brainstorming it for a new campaign, right? Um, and so this is where mental models come in because I think if you're in the same situation, you probably can relate to this, but I always found myself uh, wondering, you know, how do I go about doing this? One of my coworkers, in fact, um, at, at Cordial, uh, he used to say, we're just going to market our way through it. We're just going to be marketing our way through it, which is basically code for, we're just going to make it up. We're just going to improvise. Right. And I do not want to do that. So that's where mental models come in. And here's where I want to give a definition. Mental models are really simple thought processes or ways of visualizing how things work in reality. So it's any sort of concept or framework or worldview that you carry around in your mind to help you interpret the world and understand the relationship between things, right? So you, you can think of them as basically like uh, a mental toolbox, right? Or shortcuts you can use to get the best results. So mental models really help us simplify complex things so that we can reason through them and make better decisions. And honestly, that's the crux of being able to do your best work and what's allowed me to sort of uh, reach you know, or live up to my potential as a marketer. Now, I'm still very young, I uh, still have a lot to learn. I think we all, you, know, you, never, you never made it, right? But if you wanna do your best work, if you wanna be strategic, if you wanna be able to think for yourself, you have to be able to make better decisions repeatedly and then avoid bad decisions. And the source of all bad decisions is something that you're blind to, right? The only way you can eliminate the blind spots in your perspective or in your view or in your decision-making is to change your perspective, right? To see it in a new light, to see things through a new angle. And so mental models are basically the exercise or the tools you use to change your perspective. And so what happens when we're faced with a decision as a marketer or an entrepreneur trying to grow our business, uh, trying to you know, sift through things like, what channels do we invest in? Um, what, what do we write? Who do we hire? How do we structure this campaign? Is usually we either one, do whatever is easiest, right? Which might be like copying it or hiring someone else to do it or uh, kind of rolling the dice and guessing, maybe kind of gambling a little bit. Or two, we use our instincts and our gut feelings. So we kind of take an educated guess, right? And we use maybe some, you know, uh, tips and tricks that we've picked up along the way or things that have seemed to work uh, good in the past. Or three, we actually use an incorrect mental model that we've developed, maybe subconsciously. Um, so when you think about it, these are all very bad ways of making a decision, right? None of these are, I, I would recommend to you as good decision-making framework. Um, copying someone could lead to a lawsuit, right? Or just kind of negative press. Uh, your instincts can be wrong, right? Uh, we are wrong most of the time, I would say the majority. Using me uh, incorrect mental models can actually leave you worse off than you were before, right? So it's basically worse than doing nothing. And let me give you an example of this is that I think a lot of marketers, this is kind of like the chief uh, mistake that a lot of people do uh, use with um, with making decisions is a lot of marketers use the kind of heuristic or mental model of asking themselves, what would I want? And you might think that, you know, th this might work if you were really similar to your customers or if you were the customer, right? But what if you aren't? And I think most of us aren't really. You could have a completely different buying behavior, beliefs, uh, values, circumstances, um, dynamics in your team, different product, different industry, right? Plus, how do you argue with another marketer who uses that same logic and then ask themselves what they want, but then get to a very different conclusion, right? If everyone's asking, well, what I want, you're going to come up with a whole slew of different uh, decisions and different opinions about what you should do. So who's right? How do you determine that, right? So using this mental model of what would I want could actually be disastrous. So anyways, I'm gonna cover 10 mental models that will be good decision-making frameworks, help you see the light, change your perspective, and then you can use time after time after time to do better marketing and be more strategic. 
So the first one is first principles, also known as first principles thinking or reasoning from first principles. And it's essentially kind of like the mental model of mental models, like the, the granddaddy of all mental models and frameworks. In 2002, Elon Musk set out to send a rocket to Mars and he used the same example in refactoring growth, which is why I wanted to bring it up here because he had a problem, right? Buying a rocket cost $65 million each, which was way too much. Um, so he took the first principles approach and he basically broke it down and asked himself, well, how much does a rocket actually cost to build, to manufacture, right? And when we actually looked at it, it was about 2% of what it cost to buy one retail, right? So just over a uh, million dollars. And so instead of buying all the rockets, they built the rockets and now SpaceX is a thing. They're on their way to Mars, right? And this is how he, a company was born. This is how Elon Musk thinks. So I know that it's a good decision-making framework because Elon uses it, right? We have his endorsement. It's basically, uh, it's a basic assumption that cannot be deduced any further, right? And it's the cornerstone for a lot of other uh, mental models. Um, it's really the, the practice of deconstruction, right? Picking something apart, disassembling, deducing. Um, it's all centered on completely uh, taking something apart and then spreading it out and seeing all the individual parts that go into a system or into a product, right? It forces you to think like a scientist, um, and this is something that marketers almost never do, right? We just kind of want to go, go, go. We want to launch that campaign. We want to brainstorm and think of new things, but we never really deconstruct and look at, you know, how does this actually work and, and what actually goes on in here, right? A chemist looks at water and sees two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. An architect looks at a building and sees the beams and the columns and the insulation and the walls. A software engineer looks at a design for an application and sees a database and functions and text and images and components. So as a marketer, how should you see a campaign or how should you see a tactic? How should you see a strategy that you're gonna use for a specific channel, right? How can you deconstruct this? So what we wanna do is boil it down. And then once you know sort of, okay, these are all the components that makes this thing up. And how can we reconstruct this into something better, right? Um, and the, one of the best ways that this comes into practice is basically you want to remove all the assumptions that go into something, right? So when someone says, hey, this thing will work for us, uh, then you can, there's a, there's a lot of assumptions in there, right? You want to understand why, what are the reasons? Assumptions can be very deadly. Again, those are the blind spots that make us make bad decisions um, because it's, you're making a decision based on something that might not even be true. It's an assumption. A lot of conventions, very similar. These are practices that are done out of tradition or routine. You know, basically, we've already done it this way, or this is how everyone else does it, right? And that's how you get the marketing that is very mediocre. That's how you get the, the campaigns and tactics that kind of fall flat because everyone's doing it that way, right? Or because it's already been done, or just because maybe it's kind of plain and old and, um, and there hasn't been any innovation in that space for a while, right? Uh, and so it allows you to break things down and truly be creative, right? So now we can now we can come up with a really uh, amazing strategies, campaigns, tactics, the, the really th things that think outside of the box, right? Um, a couple of examples I'd like to use uh, from Shane Parrish. He gives the examples of the cook versus the chef, right? So a chef invents recipes, whereas the cook simply sort of follows the recipe or maybe tweaks it a little bit right? So a chef looks at the basic ingredients, the flavor profiles, the combinations that work well, uh, well together, and then mixes it uh, into something new and innovative, right? A new dish or a new sort of take, right? A cook simply takes an existing recipe and then, you know, swaps out an ingredient or two, adds a little bit more salt, you know, maybe adds like one new ingredient or, or, or switches it up a little bit, maybe changes the way that it's cooked, but you're not really changing the recipe. The, the cook is simply following the recipe. Similarly to a playmaker or a versus a coach, right? A coach designs a play, whereas a playmaker sort of improvises in a play, right? Or they kind of create their own version of a play. So again, as a marketer, how can you do this? I'll give you an example. One, one sort of way you can do this and you can use first principles in marketing is called the, the rule of five whys. So for anything that you believe or any decision you come to or anything you're considering, simply ask why at least five times. So for example, I get this, you know, a lot of people asking like, what, sh what should we invest in, right? Or, or I'm thinking about investing into SEO, for example. Uh, what do you think of that? So of course, first I ask why. Why do you want to, why do you think that you should invest in SEO? And people might say something like, well, because there are, you know, a lot of keywords that are searched every month that we can target. 
Okay, Dad, you know, why should we target those keywords? Well, because we can get a lot of traffic from those keywords if our content ranks high enough in the search engines. Um, well, why do we want traffic from people searching from those keywords, right? Because those traffic can turn into leads. Well, why do we want those leads? Because they're likely qualified based on the keywords to buy our product given what they're searching for. Why do we care if they're qualified or not? Because that means that they're gonna turn into customers or we can have a predictable revenue stream, right? But let's say we say, uh, you know, one of us in SEO and ask why and, you know, say, oh, well, there's a lot of keywords. I see a lot of search volume for this. You say, why do we want those keywords? You know, why do we want traffic from those people? And then when you really looked at it, you'd say, well, because it's traffic. But if you actually looked under the hood and you saw, you know, what type of people are searching for these things, they might not be qualified. So in that case, maybe you shouldn't invest in SEO or you should invest in SEO to target a specific set of keywords, not a whole bunch of keywords, right? It changes the lens and it allows you to go a few levels deeper than you normally would. You can use the same exercise for any channel, tactic, strategy thing that you're doing. Why should we launch on Product Hunt? right? Why should we launch uh, a podcast? Why should we um, add this new sort of tool or thing to our site? If you ask why enough, you'll remove the assumptions and you really get to the truth of should we do this thing or not, right? And you have to be able to be willing to face mm -hmm. the truth. So to summarize first principles thinking, it's kind of these three steps really. I mean, you disassemble an idea into its most fundamental parts. Number two, you reassemble the fundamental parts into something better or something new. And then three is you test and kind of repeat this process until you have something good or you, until you've reached a conclusion uh, on that decision. Okay, jobs to be done is number two. And this is one of my favorites. Um, but one day a national uh, sort of fast food chain, I forget which one, I don't know if they actually revealed it actually, but they sat down to figure out how they can increase milkshake sales, right? Um, and so the backstory is that this guy, Clayton Christensen, one of his colleagues was hired by this firm to figure out how to increase the milkshake sales. They tried a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you know, they tried to uh, segment the market right by the products so the milkshakes, the burgers, the fries, the demographics of age, gender, region, et cetera. Right. They, they asked people to list the characteristics that they liked in the milkshakes. And they basically tried everything like, Hey, let's make a milkshake for these people, or let's make a, a new flavor milkshake or, um, no matter what they did, the sales did not improve. So they ended up hiring this guy to figure out how they can improve the sales. So uh, Clayton Christensen's researcher, he kind of approached the situation to figure out what the job the customers were hiring a milkshake to do. The whole premise of Jobs to be Done is that people hire products just like they hire other people to do things, right? So every product, every service has a job just like you have a job, right? Um, so we spent a full day in one of the, the chain's restaurants, you know, just kind of documenting everything, you know, um, when the milkshakes were, were bought, who was buying them, what, uh, you know, what were they like? Um, he even asked them, you know, why they were buying it, you know, what occasion, where were they going? Did they sit down? Did they leave to go? Did they go through the drive through And he discovered that 40% of the milkshake sales were purchased first thing in the morning by commuters who ordered them to go. So the next morning, he returned to the restaurant and he sort of interviewed all the customers who left with the milkshake, who were taking it to go and asking them why, right? And he said, most of them, as it turns out, bought the milkshake to do a similar job. They faced a long, boring commute and needed something uh, to keep that extra hand busy and make the commute more interesting, right? They weren't yet hungry, but they knew they'd be hungry on the way to work. They wanted to consume something now that would kind of stave off the hunger until lunchtime. They faced constraints, right? They were in a hurry. They were in work clothes, they couldn't get a messy, and they had one hand, right? You have to have one hand at least to drive. And so the milkshakes were hired instead of something like a bagel or a donut because they were, it's easy to, to, to keep clean, right? You don't want crumbs all over your clothes or in the car. You can just sift through a straw with a milkshake. Um, there was a whole bunch of other things, right? It's not messy. You can put it in your cup holder. It's easy to store. You can give it to your kid possibly, right? You can, you can give them one as well. So by understanding the job to be done of the milkshakes, they then basically created a morning milkshake that was even thicker to last longer on the commute. Um, they had chunks of fruit with different flavor profiles. They even gave, they created a milkshake specifically for kids, right? Uh, a kid size so that parents could give it to their kids for wherever they were going, wherever, wherever they were commuting to. Um, and guess what? Milkshake sales finally increased, right? Because then they were able to market it in a way that appealed to commuters, people grabbing it to go. So with these changes, you know, they increased the milkshake sales and it really helped to understand 
why people were buying it. Um, and this is one of the, the, the really fundamental parts of jobs we've done is that your customer doesn't really want a vacuum cleaner. They want a, a clean apartment, right? They don't really want a milkshake. They want something to uh, keep them busy on their commute. You don't want an iPhone. You want something that uh, helps you keep in touch with your friends and listen to music and be on the internet while you're in bed, right? Um, it, it reframes the way that you think about products and services away from the features away from what the product is and towards outcome, what the product gets you. This is the example I use because I love milkshakes. Uh, and specifically, I love In-N-Out because I'm a West Coaster. I live in San Diego and we have a few In-N-Outs here. Um, but personas are this kind of trope in, in marketing because uh, people say, well, you have to build a persona, right? And personas define why people buy your products. Um, but they really have nothing to do with causality, with why people buy something, right? So most people say it's a persona, so they list things like someone's age, their gender, their, their race, their, their weekend habits, right? But doesn't, those things don't really explain why you eat a milkshake. I'll, I'll tell you myself, right? I don't buy a milkshake because I'm 25, I live in Hillcrest, I'm married, I have a dog, I have a degree in marketing, I'm a white guy, right? None of those things have anything to do with milkshake sales. And I, I bet you there's no correlation with any of those things with in and out milk, milkshakes. But there are a few specific jobs that I hire milkshakes for personally. I like them because I have a little bit of nostalgia. I had them a lot as a kid. And my mom bought them for me. The job she hired them for was because uh, I would always get a milkshake when we went shopping at the mall, right? So uh, on the way in, we grab a milkshake, we go shopping, and then I can actually tolerate, you know, walking through the store and watching my mom go grocery shopping or buy clothes or whatever it is. Also, I have an ice cream obsession. So like sometimes I just need to kind of like satiate that craving and I need something that uh, gives me a little bit of ice cream. But also the job I really hire it for is that it's cheap enough to not feel guilty about, right? I can always justify in my head, it's a little bit of a snack, I can grab it to go and it's cheap enough that I won't feel guilty about it, right? It's not like a, a $7, $8 milkshake. I feel fine with it being a two or $3 milkshake myself, right? Um, and so how do you figure out what the jobs are that people hire your products and services for? Well, there's what's called a job to be done interview, which is basically kind of a specific style that hones in on the emotional triggers and sort of pain points and jobs that people hire it for that led to someone switching, right? Or hiring or firing a product even. And this is kind of the, the way that it, that, it, that it works. And it really gets down to why customers switch or why they hire or fire certain uh, products um, is that there's, there's these four kind of forces in here. And the thing is that we usually vastly underestimate the costs of switching for a customer. We say, oh, it's easy. You can, you can get started anytime, start a free trial uh, or just you know 30, 30 day money back guarantee. There's a home try on thing. But there's a lot of psychological things that go on with that that we don't normally address. You need a sort of perfect storm to really get someone to hire your product and fire a competing product, for example. Um, so you can look at this diagram as essentially uh, basically like a customer acquisition strategy, if you will, right? How do we get more people to switch to our product? Well, we have to increase or decrease any one of these forces to make it uh, easier to switch from ours or to make it sort of more justifiable to switch away from what they're currently doing. And so you can, uh, you can move these and you can kind of manipulate these four forces. One is you can increase the push away from the existing product that they've hired, right? Uh, so you can show how, broad, how bad it is, uh, maybe point out sort of the, the flaws, uh, maybe point out sort of how clunky it is or if it's neglected or even how it mismatches maybe the, the brands and what people like. You can increase the product magnetism, right? So you can promote how well your product solves their problems with social proof, with testimonials, with specific examples, tutorials, et cetera. You can decrease the fear and anxiety of, of change. Uh, so you can assure customers switching away is quick and easy. And this is something actually, so I just started using a new product called Savvy Cal, which is basically a Calendly replacement. So it's a scheduling link. Um, and someone uh, uh, messaged me on Twitter and said, hey, what do you think about this? You know, someone's, uh, uh, I've been thinking about switching to Savvy Cal, but I'm not sure about how much work it's going to take to switch off of Calendly. And I had, I remember I had the exam, uh, that same exact anxiety when I was switching off of it. I was thinking like, oh, it's going to take me like an hour or two, you know, to like recreate all the events. And then I'm going to, uh, so anyways, it ended up not taking a lot of work at all. But that was, again, it was funny, like hearing someone else saying, 
uh, hey, how much, how much work is it going to be for me to do that? And as soon as I told them, oh, it'll take you 15 minutes. Actually, it's really easy to switch. They signed up right away, right? Because I reduced or I decreased the fear and anxiety of change for them. You can also decrease their attachment to the status quo or whatever they're, uh, whatever they're using now. So, you know, someone might have a sentimental attachment to something They might have a personal relationship with the founder or some sort of, uh, maybe it's a, a brand affinity through a celebrity or an athlete or um, someone that they admire, an influencer, right? So if you can point out maybe uh, if you can create sentiment with your product or if you can decrease their attachment to what they're currently using, that can be another way that you can uh, remove sort of those existing habits and allegiances. So basically, I mean, all this boils down to is if you can uh, make the attraction of the new product outweigh the, uh, basically the, the anxiety of change and the current sort of status quo they have, then you have a winning formula, right? Then it's a virtuous cycle where you can get more people to switch over to your product and hire them for it. Another one, and this is a, you know, just we've done, there's a lot of different components to that. So I'm just going to cover through uh, a few more here, but another one is competitors. Uh, jobs you've done really helps you understand who your real competitors are. The unfortunate truth is that there's probably a lot more competitors than you think. So when you're thinking about competitors, it's best to ignore sort of the product categories and instead think about who else is fighting for that same job that, that someone would hire your product for. So sometimes, um, you know, people want to use your product, but they also want to use something else that simply isn't compatible with it, right? I really want a six pack, um, but I also want, you know, I want huge biceps. I also really like ice cream and I really like pizza, right? Those are competing jobs and competing products, right? Uh, to get a six pack in, in, in huge biceps, I'd hire products and services like a gym membership, you know, protein powder, uh, workout clothes. I might get like an accountability partner or use some sort of app, right? Um, but I'd also, I'd hire products like ice cream and pizza to feel comfortable and make my taste buds happy, right? I'm also hire products like Netflix with it, you know, to be a little bit lazy sometimes. So they're completely different products and services, but they're competing for the same sort of job, right? They're, they're in conflict with, with one another. And what you'll find is that you have three different types of competitors. You have direct competitors. So they do the same job in the same way, right? So this is like Salesforce versus HubSpot or it's Nike versus Adidas, or it's McDonald's versus Burger King, or TopTel versus Upwork, right? And then you have secondary competitors, so they do the same job, but in a different way. So it's uh, bare metrics versus a spreadsheet, um, buffer versus an intern, uh, a job board versus a recruiter, for example. And then you have indirect competitors. So they do a different job with a conflicting outcome. Right, so this is like the the six packs, um, the six pack versus a you know versus ice cream, or gym membership versus pizza, right? Uh, or Drift versus form builders, or Ben and Jerry's versus twenty four hour fitness, right? These are the three different types of competitors you can have. And once you understand this, then you understand what you're really trying to get people to switch away from, right? At Bear Metrics, we got a lot of people to switch away from spreadsheets. Buffer, the social media scheduling tool, um, took over a lot of people's job for an intern to do, right? To do it all manually because it's a lot of time consuming work. And a good practical template you can use to sort of like um, hone in on what a job is that your product does is you can kind of fill in the blanks with this sentence. So it's basically when blank describes a situation, the customer wants to blank, uh, which is a motivation, so they can blank, um, which is an expected outcome. Right. So when someone lands on your website or when someone reads your email, when someone signs up for your product, when someone requests a demo, when someone interacts with you on chat, when someone goes to the beach, right? Those can all be sort of these triggers of situations. The customer wants to become a better writer, right? Uh, be more fit. They want to compare you against competitors. They want to ask questions. Uh, they want to get to know you as a person. They want to see the price, right? So that they can write their book or uh, buy something for a friend, um, automate a manual task, right? Increase revenue, um, be sure that they can trust you, bring information back to their boss, right? Uh, feel good about what they're doing, right? Be lazy, <laughs> take a break, right? So you can listen for these patterns in conversations with customers about what the situations are, what their motivations are, and what the outcomes are. And that'll really help you formulate what job someone would hire your product or service for. All right. Stages of awareness. Those are like the two like hefty ones. Uh, a lot of these other ones will be a little bit lighter now. So 
question for you. Have you ever wondered why, you know, some leads or some sort of visitors take months or even years of convincing and then others seemingly like already have their mind made up and they get started right away and they're a customer before you even know they exist. You're just like, oh, great. Here's someone new that just popped on my radar, right? Not all leads are created equal. Let's say you go to a car dealership, for example, because you spent years saving up uh, and you've been carefully researching about this one specific uh, car model and make. Um, and you're just, you're just basically going there to haggle, right? You know what car you want. You're going there just to get the best price you can find, basically. But then the salesperson starts talking to you about how they, how they have a sweet deal on a completely other type of car, right? Um, trying to convince you and then go on and on, right? How would that make you feel? On the flip side, let's say that you've only just started driving and you have no idea which cars are good or bad or sort of what you like, whether you want an SUV versus a truck versus a, you know, a sedan, for example. And you're going to the car dealership because you know that you'll need a car in a couple months uh, when you saved enough. But then the salesperson insists that if you buy today, you can get a you know, special one-time deal on one particular car, right? Both of these situations will be really frustrating because there's a, a mismatch here, right? Your job as a marketer is to actually meet people where they're at and then help them get to the next stage where they're going to be closer to buying, right? Every person has a different journey. Every person has a different circumstance that they're coming into. Um, every person has a different goal in mind. So at the car dealership, right, it'd be really frustrating for someone to say, hey, check out this other car when you already have your mindset on one car. Instead, if they had known that or were aware of it, they would just help you look at that car and, and be a negotiator, right? It would be a quick and easy sale, but instead they made it hard on themselves. Similarly, if you had no idea what car you wanted uh, and you know that you're going to need a car in the future, why would someone insist on one specific car that has a special deal today if you're not planning on buying today, right? And so both of these situations will hurt you unless you meet people where they are. And this whole idea is encapsulated in this idea of the stages of awareness, this guy, Eugene Schwartz, genius marketer, he knew this. He covered it in his book, uh, Breakthrough Advertising, way back in 1966. Um, but he basically broke down prospect or lead awareness into five distinct phases. So one on the, on the right side there, you have the most aware. So people know your product. They only need to know the deal, right? They already, they already know what car they want. They're just there to haggle. Then you have product aware. So they know what you sell, but they're not sure if, if it's right for them right? This is maybe someone who comes to the car dealership uh, and they know that you sell Hondas, right? But they're not sure which Honda they want. Then there's solution aware. So they know that the results they want, but they're not sure that your product provides it, right? So maybe they're trying to weigh between uh, Honda versus Ford versus, you know, do I get a sedan versus SUV versus a truck? They are problem aware. So they sense they have a problem, but they don't know if there's a solution. So maybe this is like, for example, uh, the, the car dealership analogy is going to break down here, right? But if, if you sense that you have a problem, maybe like, uh, hey, it's taking me 10 hours a week to schedule all of my social media, right? But is there a tool out there? Like, I wonder if there's something that can do this, right? They don't really know that there are social media scheduling tools. Same with bare metrics, right? Someone might feel like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I spend 20 hours a week just filling in a spreadsheet. I wonder, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if there's something out there that will automate this for me. And then there's completely unaware, right? So they don't even know that they have a problem. Someone's like, you know, a car, who needs, who needs one of those, right? The car, a car salesman has never been able to sell a car to someone who doesn't think they need a car. Same thing with uh, if people are perfectly fine spending a bunch of hours scheduling their social media posts or are perfectly fine with a spreadsheet uh, to manage all their finances for their SaaS business. Marketing gets easier the further to the right that you are, right? So your, your job as a marketer is to basically engineer an engine that moves people to the right that creates more awareness from someone, uh, from where someone is starting at. And the more exposure that you get or that a prospect gets, the more likely you are to get them to be more aware, you know, to buy your product or service. When I first saw the Cybertruck from, from Tesla, my first reaction was kind of just like, whoa, like it's kind of shocking. You know, I wasn't sure if I liked it or not. I was kind of like, I don't really know if I like it. It's, it's a little bit like ugly and boxy, but it's just kind of shocking, right? And then the more and more I saw it, I just kept people post, uh, seeing people post about it on Twitter, uh, kept seeing ads for it on YouTube and people just talking about it all over the place in the news, tons of PR around it, right? And then it started to grow on me a little bit. I was like, ah, I don't know, to be honest, I kind of like it. Like now I'm, I'm obsessed with it. Like I know if one day I'm gonna get a truck, I'm gonna get a cyber truck. There's actually some science behind this. 
the more that you're exposed to something, the more that you like it. It's called the mere exposure therapy or theory. Um, this guy, Robert uh, Zajonz, um, he showed basically like all these Chinese characters, these non-Chinese participants. Uh, and basically he tested that the more that a character was shown to someone, the more they said that they liked it, right? Or they picked out their, their favorite one. Um, so one of the takeaways here is one, to not be afraid to repeat your message because the more someone sees it or hears it, the more they are uh, to be convinced by it or to like it. But also two, you have to get in your reps just to be able to move someone to become more aware, right? The more someone sees your social media posts, the more curiosity they're gonna be. The more someone reads about how other people have uh, these huge problems around their spreadsheets or their social media tools or uh, their car buying experience, the more they're gonna ask themselves if they have that problem. Right? The more someone reads about other people who have had huge success in some way, the more likely they are to consider maybe if uh, that would be a good solution for them. All right, here's another one, the human action model, uh, plus kind of a bonus, um, like 3.5 uh, mental model is the pain dream fix model. Um, if you really th think about what gets people to be motivated to do something, to take action, um, there's a science behind it. And there's a couple of really key ingredients that is, uh, that's needed to get people to take action, right? To respond to your call to action, fill out a demo request form. And this goes back and kind of ties into that stages of, of awareness model. Um, but in the reality is that it's literally impossible to get people to do something if you don't have these ingredients. So you need these ingredients for everything that you do so that you can get the end, end result that you want. Um, now, the, the kind of science behind this is that this guy, uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, basically kind of a three-step model. He found that for, for people to do something, one, they have to have a uh, sense of discomfort or unease with their current situation. They have to be dissatisfied with what they're currently using or doing or the product that they've hired. Two, they have to imagine a better state. They have to imagine the future. They have to have an outcome in mind for what they want to accomplish. And then three, they have to come to believe that their action you know, can realize uh, basically their vision for a better future, right? That they can see a path forward, they can see a plan, they know that other people have done it, and then they can see how they're gonna get from point A to point B, or how this future product is gonna help them. And each one of these steps uh, has to be in place for someone to be able to take action, right? And actually uh, hire your product or fire their current product. How this kind of comes into play and one of the, the amazing ways I like to visualize this is with uh, Mario, right? So a lot of people think like, oh, the, the, the mushroom or the power up or whatever it is, is the product that you sell, right? But really what you're selling is the superpowers or the abilities that of what your product gives that person. Right? So it turns you from a regular Mario into a Super Mario or to a giant Mario, right? Or a Mario who can breathe fire or jump really high, right? Because what you're selling is the future state. It's that, that vision of what could be. And your product is step number three, which is how they get there, how they achieve it, right? The, the problem with most uh, marketing, copywriting, and sales pitches isn't that it doesn't explain the product. The product is usually always really clear, right? It's like, oh, this is a truck, or oh, this is a, a piece of software. Oh, this is a X, Y, and Z, right? The problem is that it doesn't explain who it's for and why they should care about it, right? How it's gonna help them achieve what they want. Loss aversion. This is another really powerful persuasion tactic. Um, when I was 16, there was this talent show at my church called Christmas on the Patio. And basically you'd perform as kind of like a contest to see, you know, you'd, you'd get voted on and then the winner would get a whole bunch of money. So I decided one year that I wanted to do it. I practiced tirelessly. I bought a guitar, I brought my guitar everywhere with me, you know, to school, to church, to friends' houses, everyone between. Well, about a month before the performance, I was, I was riding with a friend and we made a stop at a Starbucks and he had this little kind of two door pickup truck uh, and it didn't really have like any storage. So I just put my guitar in the trunk and we went into Starbucks to grab a drink and then came right back out. Well, when I came back out, the guitar was gone. Someone had stolen it out of the truck, out of the trunk. It was an easy steal. I just, you know, made it right there on a platter where I was like, hey, look at this, you know, nice guitar. Someone please take it. Anyways, I was devastated, not because it was a nice guitar, not because um, it was sounded amazing, not because you know of any sort of rational reason, simply because it was my guitar, simply because it was the first guitar I, I learned to play um, and I had had it with me for a few years, right? So my dad was generous enough to buy me a new guitar, um, but the reality was that I felt the loss of 
my old guitar more than I felt the gain of my new guitar. Basically, it was like, uh, this is what's called loss aversion, is basically we tend to overestimate and dwell on negative experiences. We feel losses more than we feel gains. Okay, here we go. I have a definition right here. I don't know why I said that off the top of my head, but it's more painful to lose something than it is to gain that same thing. Here's a couple of ways this can play out. One, you can focus on the loss uh, in offers, right? So talk about what a potential customer will, you, will lose if they don't purchase rather than what they would gain by buying, right? So we, tr we tend, actually the science is that we tend to give losses about twice as much psychological weight as we do with gains. You can do a lazy registration, right? So customers enter data into your service before they sign up. Uh, maybe they get to play around with the app, invest time, you know, um, uh, tested, tested it a little bit. Um, but then to be able to save their work or complete things or continue, they have to register, right? Or they have to um, create an account. Newsletters, right? You don't want to miss out on a great deal, right? What about posts from your favorite blogger, right? If you, if you can provide exceptional value to your audience, they will fear missing out on something, right? Pre-filling the shopping cart is another big one. So if you preload the shopping cart with discounted upsales, uh, users will t hesitate to remove them, right? If it's already there, you've kind of already got them a little bit. This has been tested time after time after time. And when it's preloaded, there I think it's about three times more likely to, uh, to, to buy those upsells. If, whereas if they had to add them in the first place, you're gonna get about one third of the, the number of upsells. Scarcity is another huge one, right? So as things become less valuable, they will become more, I'm sorry, as they become less available, they'll become more desirable and more valuable. So the fear of losing out on something can be a huge motivator, right? So sometimes if you say something like, uh, hey, you know, the first 10 sales uh, is at this town discounted rate, or there's only three left in the cart, or I only have room for my coaching, you know, for, for 10 people, and there's only two spots left, right? Scarcity is another big one. And sp speaking of scarcity, right? Um, it's, it's super weird, but the science behind this is that uh, basically when we look at something, if something is less available to us, then it becomes more valuable, right? So, uh, want to become more attractive, um, start dating someone else, right? Becoming unavailable essentially, right? Even if it's less attainable, right? If it's exclusive to some way of, oh, only a certain number of people can get in or it's a, uh, you have to get an invite, right? That creates some sort of, um, curiosity and attraction towards that thing. Think about it. Would the Mona Lisa be uh, any more valuable if there were a hundred of them? No, it's because there was one of the Mona Lisa that it is so valuable. The harder it is to get something, the more people want it, right? People kind of link availability to quality. Um, scarcity is basically FOMO, right? The fear of missing out is kind of an extension of that. But again, we see this a lot with limited stock. Uh, we see this for a particular model or size, right? So if you see that there's only one left and maybe that there's another uh, version of it that's not available, we kind of are like, oh, well, I better get in on this version of it or this model or this make of it. Exposing people to other buyers, right? So if you're looking around and you're seeing people, you know, just grab clothes off the shelf and, you know, take off with them, you're like, oh, I better kind of get in on this right before everything's gone. Same thing with FOMO on websites, right? Uh, there's a whole bunch of tools like FOMO is one of them, but the fear of loss kicks in, right? Of like, oh, if someone else is doing this, uh, I better too. Deadlines are a huge one, right? If you give them a reason to act now by exposing them to time limits, right? Um, I'd recommend against sort of all the fake deadlines and fake, you know, countdown timers and stuff, but you can orchestrate legit um, you know, timelines, for example, the tiny seed, you know, they're uh, an investment firm and they have these deadlines on the batch of applications they, and I know that that's a great forcing function because it gets a lot of people to apply. Uh, limited time offers with countdown timers. Again, we've, we've kind of covered this here, but you can then if, if you're going to do that, you better make sure that you're uh, going to be able to follow through on it. Time constraints for next day shipping, for example, is another big one. By the way, you see Amazon, a lot of this, like they are, they're really good about this. Social proof is another really great one. So it's sort of a unfortunate uh, example, but um, basically when, when people, uh, it, it's been proven that when people uh, are in a situation where there's a social dilemma or that there's something, some sort of social pressure, people usually always do the wrong thing. <laughs> it's like, you know, the classic example of um, when someone is in a classroom and uh, someone puts up an equation like, you know, one plus one uh, equals two. 
And then they get all the actors in the room to say that it's three or that it's four. And then social proof time and time again, because of that social pressure, people will say something wrong just to fit in, right? But basically the, the science behind this is that people assume the actions uh, and the behaviors of someone else in an attempt to reflect correct behavior for any given situation, right? Um, this is one of the big ones in Caldini's influence book, right? But basically we like to be, no one wants to go against the crowd, right? We want to do what other people are doing. Testimonials are a huge one, right? Displaying quotes from happy customers. It's one of the um, best things you can do for your website to increase conversions. You can share the social count, right? Um, I always look at this actually as, you know, something has a lot of likes or retweets or shares on social media. I might think like, oh, well, this is a really good article then. I better read it, right? Or I better share it myself and kind of join everyone else uh, before someone else shares it and, you know, gets all this kind of social cloud of, oh, great article, man, or like love this, or uh, thanks for sharing this. You can even show that the share count, right? So if it's a, a really high number, again, that gives us some social proof that this is a good article. Subscriber count is a big one, right? So if you see, hey, they've got a lot of followers, they have a lot of subscribers, they have a lot of people invest in this community, it must be good. Reviews, another huge one, especially for podcasts, right? When you see something like, oh, it's got a thousand five-star ratings, it's amazing. Same thing on Yelp with restaurants. This is what uh, my wife uses all the time is that she'll just go and search for something nearby. And then whichever one has the best rating and the most ratings is the restaurant we end up going to. It's a huge moat. Influencer endorsements, right? So if Shaq likes something, you probably will like it too. Customer case studies, huge, you know, when you do a sort of an in-depth look, it's more for, again, like uh, SaaS or for courses, right? But if you can show an in-depth story of how customers have used your products, then that creates the social proof so that people can really realistically see and envision how it would work for them. Media mentions is another great one. Even just showing raw numbers. So like Basecamp, for example, shows how many customers signed up in the last week alone. Over 6,000, right? That's a huge number. It's astonishing. Video testimonials are another big one. Real-time statistics, right? You can even show, uh, hey, 3,000 websites use film, or you can show how many people are on the site right now, right? 89 people are shopping right now. The last purchase was seven minutes ago. Verified social media accounts, right? Everyone wants that little verified. I'm coming for you. I'll get there one day. Trust seals and badges and shop, uh, shopping carts. This one, again, another huge one, but it's a, it's a, um, a badge of trust and, a, and a, an endorsement from a big company like Visa, MasterCard, Discover, PayPal, et cetera. Backing up with studies, right? If you can show that there's some sort of, basically you're leeching on to uh, the, the expertise of someone else or the authority of someone else, right? If it's said that, oh, doctors recommend it, then that's the one that I'm going to buy. Or if there's some sort of um, science behind it in a, in a proven research paper, then it becomes more credible, right? It just makes sense. You can also publicly thank for uh, awards that you've received, right? If you're at best places to work, of course, that's a, an endorsement there. You can share milestones for the company, right? So when Shopify announced that they hit 1 million merchants, right? That's a big thing to celebrate, right? And that gives it a lot of credibility of like, wow, there's 1 million other stores. Like everyone's using Shopify. Why aren't I on Shopify? Engaging brand advocates, right? So if a popular YouTuber you know gives a review and gives a glowing review, that's a big endorsement. Okay, now to wrap up here, I'm going to leave you with three sort of short, very functional uh, mental models and frameworks you can use to make better decisions very practically. So the first one is uh, effort versus impact. Um, and really what we want to get down here again is when you're, when you're weighing the cost, because something that no one talks about in marketing is opportunity costs. You really have to understand that there's a hundred different things you can do to market yourself or your business or whatever service you're providing. So you have to choose what is it, uh, which one is going to give me the most impact for the least amount of effort, right? Why, why the heck am I doing this thing? Uh, that's one of the things that I sat down when I was at Cordial was we were spending a lot of time scheduling social media posts and sort of having an online presence. And then when I actually sat down and figured out like, why am I doing this? Like who, who am I doing this for? We figured out that, you know, marketing executives don't spend a lot of time looking at brand accounts, right? They hardly spend, have time to spend on, on social media anyways, right? So if you can look at, okay, is there a high return on this investment? Then that's going to really help you out. This is what I do every time now with a new campaign or experiment that I'm running is I try to map it out and say, okay, is this, a, is this going to take me a long time? If so, it's going to need to give me a high reward or it's going to have, need to have a lot of impact. But you might find that a lot of things you're experimenting with or you're considering 
might be a high effort, low impact, which is kind of like the worst, like avoid all those, or it might even be low effort, low impact. So you need a lot of them to really make a difference, right? I always try to tell people, recommend them, go for those low effort, high impact activities or the high effort, high impact activities and just focus down on those. Mm -hmm. Another one is good, cheap, or fast. Um, I remember sitting in my chair when I started at Cordial and sort of just sitting down to learn marketing. Uh, it was my first day on the job and my new boss had just called me into the office and um, uh, he, he basically just walked over to the board abruptly and he wrote on there on the whiteboard, he said, good, cheap, or fast. And he said, now you have to choose two. You can't have all three. If you want something done right you have, and, and done right now, right, you'll have to pay a top dollar for it. If you want something done right that isn't gonna break the bank, you might have to wait a while. If you just need something, you need to stick to your budget, right? And you'll get something, but it won't be perfect, right? It might not be that good. And then he told me, this is how I want you to think about your job, right? Each project that we worked on, we have to choose two. We can't have all three. Now, this has been really useful for me because again, this is the reality. Uh, you, can, you can choose two of these things, but you're never, never gonna have that perfect storm of this is gonna be an amazing quality and it's gonna be cheap and we're gonna get it done really fast. I mean, if you want things done right, it's gonna take time, right? Uh, same thing, if, you're gonna, if you want things to be done fast, it might cost you top dollar with an expert or someone who, can, uh, you, know, who you can delegate to, uh, to expand your time on that, right? So this is kind of the, the, uh, the myth, right? That this thing does not exist, right? Uh, cheap plus fast, lower quality work, fast plus good, it's expensive, or good and cheap, it's not happening anytime soon. And finally, cribs. Um, this is a big one. I want to leave it off on because uh, this is a big one for when you're asking for feedback. As a marketer, you're constantly, you know, writing things. You're putting out new ideas. Um, you're you're putting out things for review, whether it's a new email, website, you know, copywriting, etc. And I've always had a love hate relationship with feedback because, you know, I always felt awkward making kind of a vague ask for someone, right? Like. Have you ever gotten a message from someone or like, Hey, here's what I'm working on. You know, let me know if you have any feedback and like, like, oh, I don't know. Should I really tell them what I think? <laughs> Is this really what they want? Like most times when people ask for feedback, they're not really asking for feedback. They're, they're, they're looking for approval, right? But if you are looking for feedback, this is a really useful framework I've come across where basically you kind of ask people for if something is uh, or what parts of something are confusing, uh, too repeated, insightful, boring or surprising, right? So if you're asking these things, you're saying, hey, here's my new landing page. What do you think? Is any part of it confusing? Is there any part that's kind of, you know, uh, it's, it's too repeated, right? Where I don't need to go over this thing again. Um, what do you think is the most insightful thing about the copywriting on this page? Is there anything that's boring about it, right? Are you even making it down to the bottom of the page or do I kind of lose you in places? Is there anything surprising about it, either in a good or a bad way? And this I found makes all the difference because once you give people a framework for, hey, here's how you can give me fad feedback, and once you also give other people a framework of, here's how I'm gonna give you feedback, then it really changes the dy dynamic and allows you to do a lot better work. I was just talking to uh, Dan Murphy over at Privy, he used to be at Drift, and he said the single best thing that they do in their sort of team meetings and collaboration is they constantly share what they're working on and they ask each other for feedback. Like they DM each other all the time of, hey, what do you think is good or bad about this thing? What do you think is confusing? What do you think is repeated? And he said, that's the reason why they've been able to be so successful at Drift and now at Privy. Okay, I wanna wrap that up. Hopefully 10 men's models that have changed the way you think about marketing a little bit. Um, and uh, I'll just show really quickly, just a preview. There's a lot more. Basically what I covered today was 10, but there's literally like 40 to 42, I wanna say that I cover within the course. So this is remotely interesting. I have the course on Teachable, on Teachable Discover, and would love for you to check it out. And actually, uh, we have a few questions in the uh, Q&A section. We'll give folks a minute or two here. Uh, and we can go a minute or two over if need be. Um, you know, Corey, do you want to maybe just, yeah, what, one minute quick snippet? Because also you're offering yeah. a, a promotion. And, and for all folks who are watching, that button's above our heads in the, the pop-up window. So this is... Corey is not only offering his course we've discovered, but he's offering it for a better rate than I think, you know, than he's done at any other point. So this is a unique opportunity to also access this course. Um, so if you have any questions, put them in the chat and, you know, Corey, give us a minute on your class. Cool. Yeah. I mean, talking about um, scarcity and, and urgency, the, the course normally is on, on my own site is uh, I open it up every three months. So the next one's going to be 
uh, Cyber Monday, but every three months open up for a week and then I close enrollment. I don't let anyone buy or purchase it or get into the course uh, until the next time that opens up. So with Teachable Discover, it's kind of like if you want to jump in now, it's pretty much the only way you're gonna do it. You also need to get a discount. It's a great deal to be honest. Um, I have the course broken down into problem solving mental models, right? So we'll go over things again, like first principles, jobs we've done. Also cover things like the circle of competence and inversion, a really great one that I didn't even talk about, measure versus magnitude. You can see that there's a whole bunch more here for being able to make decisions. And then I also have uh, persuasion mental models, right? So this is for things that are, uh, if you have a landing page, if you have a copywriting, if you're trying to get people to do something, to take action, these are the things that you want to do that you want to have. And literally right now, my checklist for everything that I publish is I look through and I say, okay, how am I framing this? Um, am I having the three core ingredients to get people to take action of um, making people dissatisfied with their current state, showing the vision for a, of the future state, and then creating a plan of action for people to get from point A to point B? What am I anchoring against? How can I create commitment consistency? How can I, you know, frame this in a way to avoid loss, right? I'm going through and I'm making sure that everything that I do has all these core ingredients. And that's really helped me in a lot of things that I've done. And there's also process mental models. Um, so things like innovation versus optimization, right? The grows framework, cribs, efforts, effort versus impact, good versus cheap versus fast, right? Uh, a product announcement uh, matrix. So it's broken down into those th uh, three core parts problem solving, persuasion, and process. And yeah, there's 40 plus ones. And um, so if you want to, I would personally take advantage of it now. Again, thank you, Corey. I mean, just to share, well, before we jump into your question, your Cribs framework in particular, that's one we use at Teachable. Like parts of it are. Like we, really? we well, yeah, like pieces of that. I mean, when that's we awesome. build something, we're asking is something confusing, what's surprising. Like, so even in, even for this Discover product that folks are watching this through, you know, this is something that goes into how we build things. So uh, I can I can confidently say these are things that make a difference and, and can make, a, you know, the difference between a good product and a great one. Um, with awesome. that, a few questions. Um, you know, one I saw come from the audience was, so you discussed the, you know, the awareness phases. What's one of the best, like, what are some of the best ways you've seen to discover the motivation and pains of customers? I mean, I guess, especially when they might not be aware of you. Mm. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, you can do, uh, there, there's sort of three different ways to try to uncover that. One is through uh, like a video call or some sort of interview, right? Like, like we covered with the jobs we've done uh, framework. But basically, if you hop on a call with someone, there's a specific list of questions you can ask, you know, but you can even just sort of straight up ask like, hey, what's the biggest problem or pain point that you have in your job? What are the bottlenecks? What are the frustrations you have? Tell me about, you know, do you use any sort of workarounds or uh, do you have any sort of regular routines to take care of things? Um, two is you can use a survey, right? So you can ask those same kind of questions more of in a syndicated way. Uh, or you can just ask people to fill something out and it might even, you might even ask questions like, um, you know, tell me about something that uh, you wish could be better, right? Or what's something that takes the most amount of time in your day-to-day -day work? Uh, or you can do online research. So that's option number three. And in that case, you want to be looking for things like uh, keyword research of what are people searching in Google. Uh, you can search through forums uh, and look through what kind of questions are people asking about particular products. You, you can look at reviews of different products, either on Amazon or uh, say it's like G2, or um, you can just kind of look on uh, uh, like the app store, for example, and look at reviews of how people think about apps, what's missing, what's not missing, what do they like, what do they dislike. Um, and from there, I try to just build what I call a customer insights bank. So I'm just grabbing the copy, like the, the writing, the words of what people are saying. You push it all in one place and then you can do a word search. You can sort of categorize, you know, where this, where this fits in. And that's, that's how I usually identify sort of the pains or problems that um, people are experiencing and uh, why they might be frustrated with what they're currently using so that I can introduce uh, a new product or a new, um, a new solution to their, the job they want. Incredible. Uh, and just to emphasize for the folks watching today, you know, I think Corey made it really clear that that means speaking to these potential people, uh, you know, surveys take you far, but actually asking these questions does make a difference. Um, you know, you can Google as much as you want, but you eventually do have to ask some questions to get that feedback. Um, Another question that came in, and I mean, it's a question I still have, and I did, we, we battle with it in building our products is, when you are in the early phases, like the evangelize, the unawareness phases, um, you know, 
ways of getting social proof? Do you have any suggestions, strategies? Because social proof is very important, but obviously when no one knows mm. what your product does, it's kind of, it's hard to, you can't really fake that. You need to yeah. jump over an inflection point. Any strategies mm -hmm. or guidance there? Yeah. I mean, one kind of simple tactic is you can just ask people to try it out or to give you advice about something. This is normally what I do when I'm, when I'm testing a new idea or a new product is I reach out to a select few friends or maybe kind of influencers that I know, or even just random people. And I say, Hey, can I get your advice on something? I'm working on X, Y, and Z. I would love to get your input. And if they say yes, then they say, awesome. You know, here's a free account. Um, we'll let hop on a call with you. Uh, let me show you sort of wor what I'm working on. And then I ask for their feedback, right? What's confusing, what's repeated, what's insightful, boring, surprising, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and in that way, if, if they like it, right, then you can say, hey, um, really appreciate all, all the help. You know, I'm trying to get more people to use this. Would you mind leaving a testimonial? Or can I get a quote from you about what you think about the product? You know, can I, can I get an honest review? Uh, for example, when I was creating these courses, Refactoring Growth and Mental Models for Marketing, I gave it to a couple of close friends as I was launching it. And I said, hey, can you, you know, can you take parts of the course, let me know what you think and then leave a review so I can put up, up on the site, right? So there's some ways to kind of like, um, like shortcut it and kind of like uh, backfill some of that social proof. Um, but one of the other things I think is just being really dil diligent about collecting it as you go. Um, even if it's something like, you know, some people now, like for example, for swipe files, my sort of main thing that I'm working on right now, they don't even need to know sort of the, the quality of the product. They'll just give me sort of an endorsement as a person. So let's say like, you know, whatever Corey works on is usually insightful. Or like I'm a customer of Corey's on, some, on, on his customer or on his courses too. So I bought a membership, right? So if you have some sort of other thing that you can kind of bring with you as some tailwinds, that can also help in uh, building some social proof, even if it isn't related to whatever the new thing is that you're working on. Great. Uh, and I, that, that is super helpful. Um, I know we're at time. I do have, do you have time for one more question? Cause I saw, a yeah, good I got plenty of time. Great. So we got one more question here from Dennis, uh, which I think is a great question. And it's, what do you believe is a better start? You know, a mediocre product with good marketing or a good product with very little marketing. Hmm. That's a tough one. Uh, for a good start, I would probably say a mediocre product with great marketing because uh, no product is ever going to be perfect, right? No product is ever going to be done. Things are constantly going to be, you know, can be tweaked. But I think that the marketing is really going to, is, is what's going to get people in the door. You're going to get usage. You're going to build the social proof. And you can get the feedback you need to build a great product. If you already have a great product and you don't have any marketing at all, it's going to be a huge uphill battle to then get people in the door, to get people to use it, get people to talk about it. Right. So I always recommend, you know, I'm kind of in the mantra of like start marketing before you even start building, um, focus on the marketing ahead of the product. Right. So you're sort of selling the, the vision of the product as well. So personally, I would take a mediocre product with great marketing um, in, in, with the thought that, you know, obviously the product's going to get better over time. And, and to build on that, just because Dennis, that question is, it hits near and dear to my heart. Reed Hoffman, I think said it, you know, we, we aim to ship products that are a little bit embarrassing um, yeah. because it, especially if we can focus more on marketing, because then we can get good feedback. We, we're, we'll make the product better because we, we, we're getting feedback early. We don't build this pr perfect spaceship we deliver late in the game. Yeah. Well, you know, Corey, thank you so much for, for joining us today for this workshop. Everybody in the audience, we're, we're going to wrap up in a minute. You know, let's thank Corey for his time today. Um, we're very, very excited to have your course on Discover. Like we said, we, you know, there's a CTA above me. We'll also be sending out a link to Corey's course uh, in the email that will go out with this replay. Corey, can't thank you enough. I learned a ton and our audience did as well. Thank you so much. You got it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Cool. Stop in there.